I want to welcome you, uh, all our Lone Star College students, some of which are on our campus, some of which are uh, taking online classes, and some of which are our students in dual credit classes at various high schools around the uh, service area. I want to welcome you to our first author event this evening in our Writer, Speakers, and Ideas series for the semester. Uh, so don't worry that you cannot see me, uh, the host, John Barr. I'm, this is new to us, the WebEx, and uh, we knew there would be some kinks to work out. And uh, for some reason, my uh, video is not, is not working. Uh, that's not that big a deal because I'm not the star of the show and I'm not that handsome to begin with. So nobody's losing <laughs> anything <laughs> by that. Um, so we have a we have a whole series of uh, speakers this semester. Uh, generally speaking, there's one there's a one exception to this later on in the semester. But generally speaking, these uh, events will take place on Tuesday evening at seven o'clock, uh, seven p.m. And each talk will last, or each event depends on how many questions we get. But each event will last around an hour. That doesn't mean that someone's going to talk an hour, but just we think that's how long the event might go. And we very much want to encourage you to ask your questions in the Q&A here uh, at the bottom of the chat. And I'll be uh, uh, delivering those questions to Isis after she gets done talking. Um, so a couple of things, uh, you, can, um, you can access all the events, and I'm going to post this for you. Uh, you can't end the chat. You can access, and this goes to everybody, uh, all attendees. Uh, you can access to the, the event uh, at that website, all of our events, and that's where we also have all of our videos uh, of previous talks and uh, ones that you can watch for your classes or even in class. Uh, if you need to get in contact for, with me about uh, an event or your thoughts on something, uh, this is my email address. And uh, we're very much interested in feedback that you have to offer us. So uh, the website has our writers, speakers, and ideas, um, uh, talks for the semester and previous videos. And there's my email address for anyone who um, has a question. Next week, we have, uh, next week our author is a columnist for the Wall Street Journal, uh, Jason Riley, uh, an author of several books. Uh, and he will talk uh, on one of his more current books about what he thinks the current narrative on racial inequality in America gets wrong. And the title of Jason's talk is False black power, and uh, that should be a very, very interesting uh, evening, as will this one be. Uh, so to move on, tonight we have Lone Star College Kingwood professor and author Isis Fernandez. And there you go, thank you, Isis. And <laughs> she's gonna discuss the role of writing and storytelling during pandemics and how the written word is not only a reflection of the times, but reveals what it means to be human. And ISIS will talk for probably somewhere around 20 to 30 minutes or so. And you can type in questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the page and uh, or in the chat. And you can, I will read those questions to her later. When she gets done talking, I'll probably start things off by asking a question or two, and then we'll turn everything over to the audience. So who is ISIS Fernandez? In addition to being my colleague and my friend, <laughs> uh, Isis is an educator, a writer, a podcaster, and a former journalist. She is a graduate of the nationally ranked Goddard College's MFA program. Her work has been internationally published in Queen Mob's Lit Journal, Poetry 24, Pank Magazine, I love the title of that Isis, Pank Magazine, Rabble Lit, Minerva Rising Literary Journal, and the Feminine Collective's anthology Notes from Humanity. Her Houston-based story, Happy Hunting, was recently published in the Houston Noir 
anthology, and I would recommend that to you. Her podcast, Dear Reader, is based on the popular blog of the same name. And uh, let me see, here is the address for everyone uh, to her uh, blog. And you can put that and you can uh, check, check that, check her podcast. Her nonfiction uh, memoir work uh, is, has appeared in Dear Hope on NBCnews.com, Huffington Post, and The Guardian. She's a recipient of the Owl of Minerva Award, Avona Voices of Our Nation Arts Foundation alum, a Dust Brujas Workshop alum, and a Cambilio Fellow. Wow. Uh, she's currently working on her first novel, and she is finishing her memoir, Problematic. She is Assistant Professor of English at Lone Star College. And on that note, I'm going to turn this over to Isis. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, that sounds like I do things, but I really don't, guys. <laughs> I really don't. But thank you. Thank you, John, for inviting me. So I'm, I'm super excited to be here, and I'm super excited to talk about this topic because I don't think people really think about um, pandemics as being a thing for literature and what literature does and what its its goals are. So if we can go ahead and get the um, the PowerPoint up, we can go ahead and get started. Okay, so literature, pandemics, and writers. So really what this particular brand of literature is, is about what humanity is. And pretty much all, all literature is, but specifically pandemic literature talks about humanity. So we're going to take this from a writer's point of view. We're going to talk about this entire thing from a writer's point of view. There's going to be some academic things here because I am a professor and it's kind of what I do. But really, it's mostly me fangirling about words and writing because I am a writer and I like to fangirl about writing things. So um, we're going to take that and I'm going to give you a couple of lenses to look at pandemic literature through. So what is the purpose of literature? You're probably thinking that the purpose of literature is for entertainment or informational. Um, I'm gonna say yes um, to all that. Everything you've learned in every English class about the purpose of reading and the purpose of literature and why we, why we read stories and why we read poetry, yes, yes, absolutely. But one thing that we really don't get a chance to discuss um, as writers is kind of our purpose with literature. And the purpose of literature is to be a reflection to humanity. We show um, everyone, the world, everybody essentially what it means to be a human and pandemic literature is specifically how to be a human when things are stripped away from you all the hubbub and all the um nuts and bolts things uh, that you think is important for humanity how that's stripped away and what is left over is what true humanity is and so if the purpose of literature is to be a reflection of humanity to humans to other people to kind of say this is what it means to be human in 2020 or in 1918 or in 1677, um, then what is the writer's goal? Um, and the writer's goal is really simple. It's always to get to the truth of the matter. That's it. That's the only, that's our only missive here, our only missive here. And the person who gives us this missive or has said this missive so very, very well is this person in the next slide. This is the mission that she gave us. This is Toni Morrison. We call her Mother Morrison. Um, um, RIP Toni Morrison. So she um, has been an inspiration, not just to me, but to other writers as well. Uh, any writer that's worth their salt, salt has read Toni Morrison. And she said a really interesting quote, which that gets to the heart of the purpose of the writer especially during times of tribulation, especially if during times of pandemic, war, famine, craziness that's happening in the world. And this is what she said in this next slide. This is precisely the time when artists go to work. There is, ooh, there is no time for despair, no place for self-pity, no need for silence, no room for fear. We speak, we write, we do language, that is how civilizations heal. 
that is such an important quote. I almost want it tattooed, but except the fact that I'm scared of needles, I don't. But um, it is a, an amazing quote. And, it, and you've got a lot of things playing here. The idea of that we do have a mission, we do have something that we have to do as writers, and that is to show humanity itself and the reflective art that we produce, but also of words being bomb, of words being something that is healing, not just to the writer, but to the people who read it. Because you wanna see yourself reflected in the art of which you consume. Um, so words heal, words are enchantments. Uh, you can create spells with words, and we'll talk about that and what poets do here in a minute. So that theme of healing and words comes up a lot, especially when it comes to pandemic art. So here's another lens I want us to look at. And this is what I want you to understand with every fiber of your beautiful little being, that stories are about people and how they choose to live their lives. Point blank and simple, this is what every story is about. Yes, we'll talk about themes. And yes, we'll talk about all the wonderful things that uh, someone who teaches English should talk about and someone who writes should talk about, but boiled down to its very essence about what stories are. They're about people and how they choose to live their lives. And this is how we show humanity to the world. This is how we show how words can be bomb, how words can heal. We show, and this is what writers do, this is like literally our only, our only job, to show what humans are, what humanity is, and to find truth in that, in that which we write and in that which we work in. So when we talk about pandemic art um, lit, I am not going to limit it to just COVID, though it would have been so much easier to do that. I'm gonna talk about pretty much um, COVID. I'm gonna talk about, of course, the last pandemic we had, which was the influenza 1918. I'm gonna probably talk about some other pandemics. So. I'm gonna go through the whole gamut. Yay, pandemic lit is an actual genre, yay. Okay, next thing. When we're talking about pandemic lit, uh, I want us to understand that there's a timeline to things because we're gonna talk about this in context and we're gonna talk about context in the next slide, not yet, but in the next slide. Um, so the timeline for pandemic lit is pretty much similar to pretty much everything when you're talking about maybe uh, lit from war, lit from um, uh, a super um, event like an explosion or a famine or something. Um, um, so what you want to understand is that there is always a run up to the pandemic lit or to the lit of war or to the lit of whatever, right? So there's a run, off, uh, run up to it and you can see some things starting to emerge. You'll see the theme of um, fear starting to emerge, the theme of questioning norms starting to emerge. And then the pandemic hits. And this is where you won't see a lot of work. You'll see some work happening, but you won't see a lot of work because pretty much everybody is focused on surviving. Um, and so it takes a little bit to, as a writer, to um, understand and to break down what this means and to really do a lot of thinking because writing is lots of thinking even when you're not thinking, you're thinking, so you're always working. Um, so you do a lot of thinking. So it's not, you're not gonna see a lot until the aftermath. And the aftermath can be a direct aftermath. Like um, you'll see stuff that's like pandemic, it's 1918-ish, 1920, you'll see some work coming through. Or you won't see something for decades, or you'll see something um, that's referencing or alluding to a pandemic, right? So that's what, what I mean by aftermath. And I will define context for you because context is super important. When you read any piece of literature, um, you want to read it in context. You cannot read something like Frankenstein without knowing the context. You can't read something like the pandemic lit without knowing the context. What is it actually having a conversation with? What is this piece playing with? What is it trying to say? So all these wonderful rhetorical devices and rhetorical skills that you thought that you wouldn't be able to use after taking 1301 and 1302 for your beginning Englishes have come back to haunt you, my friends. <laughs> yes. 
you have to use this even after you're done. Yay. Well, you know, it is what it is. So here's some common themes here for those people playing at home. Um, the common themes, and this is not all of the themes. These are just some of the themes. It plays with lots of themes here. Pandemic lit plays with lots of themes. You have fear, which is very obvious, like what happens if this thing gets me? What happens if it hits my loved ones? How am I going to live? What is this uncertainty of this fear, right? Or fear of uncertainty. You have the, this urgency of time running out. Um, I have to do this before X happens or the time is running out um, and this will happen. And one of the pieces of literature we're gonna talk about um, to, today, there's literally a clock in the story that rings every hour on the hour. It literally marks time. You have love as a theme and ironic or not ironic, it depends on how you look um, at things of love being a theme. We're gonna talk about love and illness because Virginia Woolf talks about it. And so when we talk about Virginia Woolf, I'll talk about love here as the theme. Obviously mourning and, um, and endings, and endings could mean death or endings of relationships or endings of a way of life. The mourning of those endings are also themes. Um, there's lots of comparison to war, of pandemics being like a war. Um, and rightfully so, because you are literally fighting for your life or fighting for the lives of, of your loved ones or of people you know. You actually hear about the casualties of oh, such and such had this, such and such didn't survive, such and such is bedridden. So it's very, very similar to war for the exception of you don't see your enemy. You don't see your enemy coming really. Um, and so that's talked about a lot in pandemic lit. You have the evaluation or the commentary of old normal versus new normal. I we get to see that on, on Twitter all the time. I see it every day. Um, so that's talked about as well in pandemic lit. And of course, the tough decisions that are made within a story or a poem, the tough decisions that could mean the difference between you being human and expressing your humanity versus being just someone who's awful. <laughs> so tough decisions, um, which isn't really a tough decision, but they're tough decisions um, regardless. So let's talk about Virginia Woolf. Um, we can't talk about any, I feel like we can't talk about any literature about sickness at all or with plague or with um, pandemics unless we talk about Virginia Woolf's one being ill you can actually Google this. This is out for you guys to read. You can purchase on um, being ill. This is an, an essay that she wrote. Um, and it's in, and she's got, um, she's got some ethos here. Um, she's had influenza almost all her life. Had almost all her life. That's an exaggeration. She had the flu before the flu was a thing in 1918. Then she had the flu when it was a thing in 1918. Then she had the flu lots of other times. Um, so she's had the flu and she's been bedridden and sick. She's also suffered from mental, mental health issues. And so she talks about illness being a thing that uncovers the truth. Remember that I said that writers, our purpose is to uncover truth, to show humanity itself and how we show humanity itself is through the literature that we create, right? And so she talks about people write, all, people write always about, about the doings of the mind, the thoughts that come to it, the noble plans and how it has civilized the universe, right? So that is like a higher up type of thing when really writing comes from heart, doesn't really come from brain. Yes, there's thinking, like thinking as in processing, but not overthinking, it really comes from heart. And so she talks about illness being kind of an equalizer and being one of those things that like, that's, strips away the um, building of the cogs, the uh, army of the upright is what she calls them. Um, and it is similar to love, again, remember another theme of pandemic lit in that um, it disguises itself as love, that it plays the same old tricks. So how love works in theory, I guess, is that um, love, love is all, all equal, all knowing, all 
all um, kind of taking you out, taking you and kind of shaking you, puts you on your backside and says, this is what the truth is. Illness does the same thing. And so when she writes about this and being on being ill, she's really talking about the same thing that Toni Morrison talks about. She talks about words as um, really words of sanity, but really words as a way of healing um, and showing what the truth is. All right, Catherine Ann Porter. I included her in the list. There's so many. Let me just preface this by saying, let me stop. Let me preface this by saying that there's so much pandemic lit out there that choosing who and what to profile was very difficult. And I basically chose Catherine Ann Porter just because she's Texan. Literally, that was the only <laughs> reason why I chose her. She's also a pretty darn cool writer and had a really interesting life. So if you get a chance to like Google her name and read about her life, she got married at 16 to a land baron, um, divorced him like a year or two later, um, left Texas, went to New York, became a journalist, did all the like an amazing, amazing life. So yeah, she was born, she's a Texan through and through. Um, she was misdiagnosed with tuberculosis, but it ended up being bronchitis in 1915, that was such a bad diagnosis by her doctors, bless their hearts. She actually ended up having the flu as, uh, flu as well, so she has some echoes here as well. So she wrote this wonderful, and I'm literally, um, I started this here in the last week, um, this novella, which a novella is uh, a book, but shorter. It's actually, um, some people will put it at, uh, 200 pages ish. Um, so, uh, Pale Horse and Pale Rider um, is part of a bigger, larger piece. So, if you go and find the book, the book is called Pale Horse and Pale Rider. The short story where she talks about pandemic or sets the story in a pandemic is called Pale Horse and Pale, Pale Horse Pale Rider. Um, it's literally this story about a relationship between Miranda and Adam. Miranda's this newspaper writer, very, very meta, this story in some, in some ways. And um, Adam is this soldier, right? We, we have a, a national war, war, war going on around this time. Um, and during this pandemic, he decides that he's going to take care of Miranda. And then he ends up getting, the, the, getting influenza and ends up dying, spoiler alert. And so you have, again, those tough decisions that you have to make you have this theme of war, you have, and the theme of war and the background of war almost, um, you have this idea of time running out as well that's happening here. So these themes are still playing in this particular story. Um, and I can tell you about the beginning part of this novella. She plays with um, stream of consciousness in a way that when you're reading it, you, you understand that the main character, Miranda, is having a delirious episode and so that's another way she's kind of infusing the pandemic in her writing and kind of bringing the writer or the reader right there into the world on what it is like to have the flu before everyone can get flu shots, essentially. And this one is probably one of my favorites. Um, one of my favorites. Um, the Mask of Red Death. Look, Edgar Allan Poe is twisted in so much of the best, best ways. Even his life is kind of mysterious. Like I recommend a po a post short story at any time of life. Like you don't just have to read The Raven or read A Telltale Heart. You can read other things. Definitely read The Mask of Red Death. So here's the thing about this. Written in 1842, it doesn't necessarily um, talk about a specific pandemic. Um, uh, academics actually talk about this there's not really a pandemic happening around 1842, so there's nothing that is a direct link, just like um, Catherine Ann Porter, that there's a direct link to influenza, the influenza pandemic. So what they're kind of tying it back to is tuberculosis. I believe his wife had tuberculosis, his mother had tuberculosis, so he had, had saw this firsthand. And of course, um, cholera, cholera was a thing, still is kind of a thing in some parts of the world. Um, and he was he actually saw cholera how it ravaged the body and so it's almost like he combined parts of those two things and created a pandemic in this particular story 
So this is a story, if you want to know about how badly a quarantine can go, this is the story that you read. So really, I don't want to give too much away, but there's a prince, there's a castle or palace. There's a quarantine, there's a pandemic raging. Everybody is just raging, raging. Like people are dying left and right. And homeboy invites all of his like nobility friends to come party with him in his castle. There are seven rooms, each of them have, have colors. I will let you like deconstruct the metaphor of that on your own. But yes, people die and it's you know hilarity ensues. So um, I will let you read that on your own, but I do want to talk about um, some of the things he's talking about or some of the elements that are there. This is the, this is the story that literally has a clock in the story that marks time and time stops. Everyone in the story as as the clock is marking time at the top of the hour, everyone stops. There's a, there's a dread that happens in the room. So there's a fear. So there's another theme that ha that's happening there. And, you know, it's almost like a countdown. And I will leave it at there because I don't want to spoil it for you. You should really, really read it. Um, so I think what he's really saying here, as far as an argument in this story, is that humanity is stupid and a bit selfish. Um, there's other things like, no, everybody dies, don't run away from death, blah, 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 blah. But really, I think he's saying this is the stupidest thing ever to invite all your friends over during quarantine when like everybody's dying from things. Um, so yeah, Edgar Allan Poe, recommend him always, always, always. He's got a story for almost every occasion. So definitely recommend him. All right, so we've talked about the past and let's talk about the present and the future. And the things that you kind of wanna keep in mind here about the current iteration of art. You want to talk, we're going to talk about poets and poets of all walks of life. I'm going to actually read you a couple of poems. Um, we're not going to go too deeply into it because this is not my English class, but, but we can see me after and we can talk about poetry all you want. Um, we'll talk about kind of what is new in this pandemic that wasn't around in, in 18, 1918. And of course, Afrofuturism which is a genre you really want to look at when you're talking about art that's about to be created, like the next step of art in pandemic lit. So as the poets say, let's get to work. And so we are gonna get to work. And the thing about poets is that they're nimble. They work really, really fast. Like poets, bless their hearts, can just turn out a couple of stanzas in like a couple of weeks. And it takes novelists and memoirists a while um, and so they're able to kind of think things through and how they're able to do it is that they actually take a slice of things where a slice of maybe what's happening in a pandemic versus what um, novelists, they, they think about the whole thing. They think about the earth, the moon, the stars before they settle on a planet to talk about um, where like poets can talk about like this rock on a particular planet and they're fine. Um, I know I'm about to get a bunch of emails from a bunch of my poet friends who are probably watching and that's okay i'm ready for your emails okay so we're going to talk about three poets elizabeth velasquez jericho brown and claudia rankin because of time we're, i'm probably just going to read just elizabeth's and jericho's pieces and we'll talk about we'll talk about claudia's pieces or sorry respect on her name miss rankin's pieces um in passing and so I want to read you Mommy and Papi Go Outside During Quarantine. A little bit about Elizabeth, um, Elizabeth, I should say. Um, she, New York-based Puerto Rican poet. She does actual, that's the wrong word. She does poetry that's more traditional and she does poetry that's spoken word poetry. Um, and she's definitely one to watch. She's well known for this poem called Elephant. So if you want to Google her and Google the title of her of her poem it's fantastic i it's so good that i actually teach it in my 1302 class um and so in this particular poem she talks about death and the geriatric experience in new york with this pandemic um especially during quarantine specifically because you know new york, new york was, was an epicenter and she talks about freedom and what that freedom means so I'm going to read you, it's a short poem and I'll read it to you. So I hope, I hope I do it justice. I don't read it like she does with her beautiful, like New Yorkian accent. 
mommy and papi go outside during quarantine. And it's not that they don't care, and it's just that the city made the buses free now, and Poppy found out that this is the only time he could get in through the back and not get a ticket. If they didn't want him to travel, they should have raised the fare instead. Have you ever seen Brooklyn when it's free? I haven't, but I asked him to describe it to me so that I can remember this moment when Poppy sounds like he's made it somewhere his body doesn't owe anyone anything. Later, when I call mommy, she says she is still making trips to the post office. There's no line now, so her legs maze around the retractable belts, quick and painless. Her back might even feel young enough for a walk in the park later. And she heard, but she can't be sure if it's true. So maybe I can use that Google thing to look it up that there's a three month grace period for evictions. So maybe Fulano gets to cook in their kitchen one more time, or maybe Fulana de Tal doesn't have to choose between food and rent this month. What an awful relief to be forgiven for not dying. The news who has always crowned my city a warning gave it a new halo, epicenter crawling with diseases like mommy and papi who buy bodega coffees brimming with contagion and abuelas who would rather wrap their last breath around you than to listen to a government who has never known what distance can do to a person who has only ever inched closer to make it easier to steal and isn't our breath something we've had to learn to protect anyway? Isn't this the war we were born for? Haven't we always risked our bodies for our humanity? Stay inside, mommy. Stay inside, papi. It's the new way I've learned to say goodbye. What privilege to stay home and not feel like I am missing out on morning joyride. Just one block for store-brought coffee or the conversation of not having to wait so long to see if any good news has arrived in the mail. So that is Elizabeth. This is the part where you like you snap <laughs> because that's what poets do. Um, so that is Elizabeth Velasquez, and you see how she's playing here or having a conversation with um, the experience of freedom and what that means and what that means for people who are older, especially her parents, especially people who are older than her parents, and the denial of you know Jolo. I'm gonna live my life anyway because the buses are free. Like. Don't tell me to stay inside and the privilege of being able to have that. So that's an interesting thing. And you see how those themes of fear come up, those themes of like, of um, decisions, of tough decisions having to be made, um, of endings um, and the fear of those endings having to be made. And Jericho Brown, I'm gonna read Jericho Brown because I love Jericho Brown. Um, I was one of the ones who, was jumping for joy when he won the Pulitzer for the tradition. It's a great, it's a fantastic collection. If you've not read, um, you probably haven't read, but if you, if you want to read a really fantastic poetry collection, like read the tradition, like he literally created his own form of like poetry. Like this is how good this dude is. Like he's fantastic. Um, and so in his, in this particular uh, poem, he talks about, um, or he has a conversation with the act, the pandemic, essential workers and, of course, in context, Black Lives Matter. And so I'm going to read, um, I probably won't finish reading all of it just for time, but I do want to read some of it. Um, and this is actually, he. It, this was actually printed in the New York Times, so they actually have a nice clip of him reading it. So I'll read, um, I'll read like a stanza. Um, just so you get a sense of it, and then definitely go to the New York Times and listen to the master read his own work, because I cannot do it justice. Say thank you, say I'm sorry. I don't know whose side you're on, but I am here for the people who work in grocery stores that glow in the morning and close down for deep cleaning at night, right up the street in cities I mispronounce in towns too tiny for my big black car to quit, and in every wide corner of Kansas where gro going to school means at least one field trip to a slaughterhouse. I want so little, 
another leather bound book, gimlet with a lavender gin. Bread so good when I taste it, I can tell you how it's made. I'd like us to rethink what it is to be a nation. I am in a mood about America today. I have PTSD about the Lord. God save the people who work in grocery stores. They know a bit of glamour is a lot of glamour. They know how much it costs for the eldest of us to eat. Save my loves and not my sentences. Before I see them, I draw a mole near my left temple, add flair to the smile they can't see behind my mask. And I'll stop there so you can finish it there. But you see what he's playing with, the images that he's playing with, the images that he brings it up, the glow, we can almost see the glow of the central workers having to, you know, be an HEB and deep clean before and deep clean after. And the idea of, you know, America at this point of time dealing with racial strife and instability and what it means to be American at the time that we're questioning what it means to be human at a time of pandemic when we're all kind of locked inside where we can't even hug each other without risking our health. So interesting things. And you see how poets just, they can, they can get at, at something so much quicker than like a novelist, right? I'm so jealous of them, so very, very jealous. And Claudia Rankin also has a, has a poet, a uh, poem called Weather, um, also written in 2020. It's a, it's, it was published at the same time that um, the last one was written or published. She won, or she should have won the Pulitzer for Citizen. I'm saying this right now. Email me if you disagree, but whatever. She should have won it for Citizen, but she didn't. She won um, the National Book Circle Award for Poetry and Criticism in the same year, the only person to have done it. And her particular poem talks about Black Lives Matter and social distancing. And that's, and she plays with the theme of um, fear, of course, they all play with the, uh, almost all play with the, with the theme of fear, but also talk about time, um, time ending, the urgency of time. You won't get to hear me read for the rest of this presentation, I promise you. Um, so what's the difference between this pandemic and past pandemic? Movies, TV, and streaming. You, we, this is the first pandemic that we're actually going to get, like, people making movies about, or during or about this particular pandemic. So it's going to be interesting. So what I'm saying is the future of literature and the future of art because of this pandemic is going to be really interesting to see. I am going to predict, I'm putting it right now in the next five years, like the art is going to be stellar. Like the literature is going to be insanely good because we've had so much to draw our work from. So love in the time of cholera. Um, you've probably heard about this on the socials. Um, this is actually going to be a... Um, they call it a TV anthology. It's a, it's a limited series TV show is what it is. And this limited TV um, anthology is going to be on free form. So like ABC, but like not on basic cable. Um, and here is what the synopsis is. There's the couple hoping for another baby played by real life couple Leslie Odom Jr. and Nicole, Nicolette Robinson an elderly woman who can't see her husband in the hospital due to COVID-19 precautions, a separated couple pretending they're still together for the sake of their daughter, and a sexually fluid duo who has roommates exploring their feelings for each other. So all of these sound like interesting scenarios because these are real life scenarios. And what is gonna be interesting with this, I think when the dust settles, is this is I think one of the very first TV shows, like scripted series, that was filmed with the whole crew kind of quarantining themselves outside of where the actors are. So how they filmed it, if I recollect correctly, is that they gave the actors the cameras to set up and everything was remote. So that's gonna be really interesting to see how well this does. I don't know if this has started in free form yet. I'm pretty sure it has or it's about to start. Um, I will definitely be watching this just to see how the stories work and um, if they're doing the stories justice. And so we're going to talk about Afrofuturism here. So we've, we've talked very recently on some things to look for and how um, literature is going to manifest here in a couple of different ways. 
with the pandemic art, we talked about poetry, how it's kind of manifesting now. The poets, man, they move really quickly. And now, and then we talked about how TV, movies, streaming, it's going to manifest uh, into this. Now, Afrofuturism, it's going to manifest into this. And you're probably wondering what this is. And once I explain it to you you're, and give you an example, you're going to understand that you've already interacted with uh, at least one big um, piece of art of Afrofuturism. So Afrofuturism is any art, so literature, music, paintings, any art that features members of the, of the African diaspora center stage. And it aims to ask um, what will happen in the future and how members of the African diaspora um, will come out, essentially. So it aims to see or aims to discuss the future where Black bodies are included. Point blank and simple. So it really leans very heavily on dystopian and science fiction. And they're using, in some Afrofuturistic stories, you lean on science fiction and dystopian as illusions um, very, very heavily. So you're reading something maybe like Spider the Artist, my 1302 reads Spider the Artist, and it talks about one thing, but it really talks about something else, right? And so you'll see this happening. A good example of Afrofuturism is Black Panther. And let's just say RIP Chad Bozeman. Um, so RIP him, um, it was a big hit for the African-American community, the Black community, especially Black Panther being such a huge hit in 2018 and so meaningful for people of the, of the, of the African diaspora. Um, Binti is a, is a great book. Kindred is a great book. Dirty Computer by Janelle Monae and actual album that is Afrofuturistic. Um, and so this is what it is. And so you're going to see a lot of work coming from this genre dealing with the pandemic. And how do I know? Because it's already doing it. Um, yeah, it's already doing that specifically because of pandemics. It's already doing it because the idea of fear and death and things ending and those big things have already been played with or by Afrofuturistic authors. Um, Octavia Butler, Dawn, is the OG of Afrofuturism. I can do a whole other thing on Afrofuturism. I'm not going to do it tonight, but these are just some examples of some, uh, some stories that are kind of leaning almost towards pandemic art um, or lit. The only reason they are not is because there's literally not a pandemic, but all the things are there. Via Literary Magazine is where you're going to find all this art, the emerging of all this art coming up before they hit mainstream. And in case you didn't have enough things to read, this is all the stuff, <laughs> all the stories, books, um, novels that um, are pandemic literature. This list by no means is the end all be all. This is just stuff that I wanted to read, but I didn't get to. Um, in preparation of this particular um, talk today. So as you can see, lots of stuff to read. Pandemic literature is a thing. It's almost its own genre. And there it is. Yay, fun times. All right, I think we're, we're good on questions. OK, uh, I'll start us off, Isis. And, yeah. and uh, you can all, you can uh, click on the chat box, everybody, uh, for uh you know any questions that you might have for isis but let me start with just a couple of questions uh, one and this is related to afrofuturism i think is that uh, well this pandemic has hit black the black community uh harder right than um uh, than other communities in america and i based on your talk i what I'm understanding you to say is you're predicting that we're going to get a pretty rich vein of poetry and literature out of these writers as they reflect upon this, uh, as they reflect upon this experience that we're going through. Is that, is that really kind of what you're arguing? Absolutely. You're going to see Afrofuturistic writers, um, and I'm even seeing right now through Fire, Fire Lip Magazine, um, some work happening, um, but it's very, very new, very, very recent. So I wouldn't even 
put a finger on and say, oh, pandemic lit. Um, some work about COVID, specifically lockdown qu quarantine, happening right now from Afrofuturistic writers. Um, they're going to lean into it. They're going to lean into it, and it's going to be epic, and it's going to be amazing. It's going to be something worth watching out for and reading. Okay, I, I, I think that's I think that's really interesting. Um, another and and then another question I had was, um, it seems also that what you're saying is that one of the most important things we should be doing, all of us in a time like this, is actually to be doing our own writing and our own poetry, writing our own stories and our own poetry. If if words heal and those sorts of things is that something you would recommend for our, for us for our students for community members that might be watching um uh, you know i, tell I will always recommend that <laughs> i will always recommend to write um because words words have weight um you know fix and stones will break my words but um words will never hurt me is a lie um <laughs> it's a lie words do hurt just like words can hurt words can heal um and so because they can heal, conjure up your own healing and use words to do it. So I always recommend that. Okay, everybody, we'll take any questions that people have at all uh, in the uh, chat box you, or uh, at the bottom of the screen, you can simply click on the, on the chat uh, on the question. Uh, any questions that you might have for ISIS, please uh, go ahead and ask. There's no question that is uh, a dumb question, believe me, unless you want to just hear uh, Isis and I talk. Okay, Isis, this is this is from, um, uh, I believe, Zach Wilson, mm -hmm. and he says, when you refer to the author's job as a truth teller and an, and an exhibitor of the human experience, is that referring to fiction or is that referring to nonfiction? Both, both, short, short, okay. short, both. Um, so I limited this this presentation to fiction and poetry, which is like when people think of literature, they think like, oh, this really cool book or this really cool poem. Um, but memoirs are doing some work. They are doing some creative nonfiction writers are doing some, some heavy work during um, this pandemic um, because that's, um, so creative nonfiction writers, um, we love to see our stuff in journals, right? And so a lot of journals are asking for that work now. Um, and so that's where you'll see a lot of this. And so, yeah, the memoirists are going to, ironically, are already starting to do the work. They're the people, they're the folks that I thought would take longer because they have to like think things through more. But ironically, the novelists are taking the longest. Okay, this, this next question is, from uh, a friend of mine, actually a relative of mine, Dave Morse. And uh, Dave refers to nonfiction narratives, uh, which may present complications that, that you're trying to uh, get across in a narrative. But his question is, uh, is pandemic lit or fiction, does it follow a different arc really? Um, than nonfiction? Is the narrative art going to be a different in a fictional work about a pandemic, do you think? Mm, no, but I think the approach is, uh, the approach will be different. I mean, the arc is the art, you know, like, oh, woe is me, this is difficult, this is hard, da 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 da, -da the end, and then something happens at the end, right? That's the yeah. arc. But the, I think the approach is going to be different. I think what you're going to see is a lot of play on um, form, um, for sure. So you'll see like um, Catherine Ann Porter plays with uh, with delirium, right? Plays with uh, with um, stream of consciousness to make it look like it's like the the person's delirious as they're telling the story. So you're gonna you'll probably see a lot of that. You're probably gonna see. I wouldn't. I would not be surprised if I saw like an essay, a creative nonfiction piece written. Um, like a hermit crab essay, so written in like like a medicine, you know, a, a prescription, like a like a prescription, essentially. So you're going to see a lot. Uh, I think you're going to see a lot of play with form for sure, for sure. Okay, 
This is the next question from Nate Graham. These are all great questions, everybody. What is the goal of a writer and how do big events like a pandemic help with their craft? Um, so the goal of the writer is, like I said before, it's kind of um, to, for truth, right? You, you find truth, you find the truth in everything, right? Um, and so how is, how is this gonna play? So the second part of that question is, can you tell me again, John? How do, uh, how do big events like a pandemic help with the craft of being a writer? Oh. Help with the writer's craft. <laughs> oh, lots. Um, because you, that's when people's um, guards come down. You know, we all have this guard, right? We, well, we used to before we were all in lockdown and going to school like online, but like 8 a.m. We have class at 8 a.m. You have a class at nine, you have a class here, then you have to go to work and then you have to go this. And so it's like, it's a lot of, you know, life in, life out. Not a lot of time to sit and reflect, right? Um, we don't get to, we don't get to um, play with our ghosts, essentially is like what I call it. We don't get to play with like the big questions in life unless like we, you know, we're there insomnia, insomnia hits and it's like two in the morning and you can't, you can't sleep. You're like, what is all this for? The meaning of life, whatever. This is what these big events do. They take away all that, that we consider uh, our lives and kind of boils it down to how are you going to survive this? How are you going to survive this? What does it mean to be alive and be human at this time in life? And so that's where we as writers kind of swoop in as a yeah, you're, 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 you're trying to uh trying to address the those issues i think it was oscar wilde that said that we all wear masks but at some point the masks have to come off and i suppose these big events like pandemics do that yeah okay, the, next question, the next question is from tara campbell is another good question how do you emotionally manage appreciation of pandemic literature without getting completely depressed <laughs> That's a good question, Tara. Um, you read like romance fiction. <laughs> like you read, you can't, look, you, if you're gonna read like book after book, story after story of pandemic lit, you, you are gonna get really just like, what is life? What is my life right now? With everything, you, you gotta, you're gonna have to take a break from it. You're just gonna. Um, even for doing this presentation, all the stuff I read, I needed to take a break from. <laughs> I did. I'm just like, oh, I really don't want to read Love, Love in the Time of Cholera again. Oh, I really don't want to read this again. Uh, I will pick these three. <laughs> and then I'm going to go like watch a Marvel movie and right. Netflix. You know, right. like, pace yourself. Okay, this next one is from Sharna. And Joe, I hope that's correct. And Sharna, I apologize if I mispronounced that. What would you assume is giving these black authors and poets the, these inspirations, especially during quarantine? Oh, life, our lives. Um, look, we, we deal with this all, all day, every day. Like the, the life of a black person in the, on the globe is there's always an element of fear. There's always an element of time ending. There's always an element of mourning. There's always like those things are ever present. So that's what like, yeah, <laughs> yes, that's the answer. So they're more they're more intense, in other words, and therefore it's found it's it's displayed in their poetry and their fiction. Absolutely. Okay. The next question, these are great questions, everyone. I really appreciate it. From Stephanie Marchina, uh, how has the pandemic uh, reflected on your writing and or teaching? Ooh. Let's start with the writing. It was hard to write for a long time. Um, it was hard to write. You know, Toni Morrison, you know, she said what she said, that wonderful quote at the beginning. Um, so it's difficult to write. And then when I finally was able to pick up the pen, I ended up, um, I ended up writing fiction, going back to short stories um, and just saying, all right, I'm, I'm going to write fiction as an escape. So my, so the fiction I've written so far is nothing to do with pandemic at all. I needed it as an escape. As far as teaching, um, 
it's more about the technical side, making sure that students are okay. I haven't included any of this, though I was really eyeing, like, I do have an Edgar Allan Poe story for my Thirsty No Tutor read. I'm thinking about switching it out at this point. Um, and uh, I do have an Afrofuturistic story, um, which is fantastic, which um, can talk about the pandemic. So that's how I'm dealing with it as a, as a professor um, who teaches this lit and as a writer who writes. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, I, we're doing something on a smallpox academic in my class. Okay, no, the, next, the next question is from a student of mine, Claire Howard, I believe. And she says, do you think because we are in a pandemic lit time, there will be an influx of that specific genre as opposed to other genres of literature? No, um, because there wasn't an influx for the for the for the flu, uh, the influenza pandemic. Um, and because the, it, takes, it takes a the while. Spanish to... flu, you mean the Spanish flu? There wasn't as much of an influx, you mean? Right, right. Okay. There wasn't as much of an influx. Um, and it takes a while to kind of break it down. Well, you will see like more, especially for novelists, what will happen is like five years, three, three, five, seven, you know, the odd numbers, you'll start seeing a lot of that happening because publishing is looking for it pretty much. Okay, I think we've got time for a couple of more, a uh, couple more questions. Uh, this is from Nate Graham. Um, why is it so important to read pandemic literature in context? Can you elaborate on that a little bit? It's for the same reason you would read anything in context, right? Because you want to know what conversations that writer is having with, having with that piece. For example, um, the Jericho Brown piece I read, the Elizabeth uh, Elizabeth Velasquez piece that I read. Yeah, they talk about pandemic. Read, created during the pandemic. It's about the pandemic, but you also need to know that Black Lives Matter also is a big is a thing. Happened, happening, and so Jericho Brown talks about that. You need to know that New York was the epicenter. And New York has been an epicenter for lots of things. This is just the latest iteration. Elizabeth talks about it, right? So right. they're having these conversations. These writers are having these conversations and they're having it in context with other things, not just the pandemic. Right? Okay. Uh, the last question is from a student of uh, a student. Now your colleague, uh, Dr. Beeman is going to want to know uh, how love in the time of Corona might parallel love in the time of cholera. So, uh, but I wanted to get the student's question in uh, okay. uh, at the very end. So uh, Tai Chi Porter asks, I remember back when Black Panther came out, Lupita Nyong'o said that if Africa was never colonized, it would look similar to Wakanda. Mm -hmm. Do you also believe that? That's a good question. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know is the answer. You're gonna... uh, <laughs> um, I think Lupita Nyong'o is a smart cookie. Um, and I think she um, definitely more African than I am. And so I think she's got a point. Do I agree with her or not? I don't know. I haven't studied as I haven't studied the history of the continent as much as anybody else. You know, we don't really get that in our academics on this side of the great big ocean. Um, so I don't know if that is true. I think eventually I would imagine that like the African continent, con content would be like Wakanda and reach out and help. Okay. But that's where I'm at with it. Okay, well, that's our final question. Isis, what is your email address if uh, students want to type uh, contact with you with other questions? It is Isis, I C E S S, I believe there's a dot, dot Fernandez at lodestar.edu. And, and I have recorded this, everybody. I forgot to uh, start it right away, and I apologize about that, but I did record it and uh, we will get it up on our website, um, and I think this has been a success. We had over 70 people in attendance tonight, which is good, and it's a good introduction uh, to the series for the semester. So 
Uh, thank you very much, Isis. There's her contact information there. And uh, thanks everyone for attending. Bye guys. Be sure to follow us on social media at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Like this video, leave a comment, and hit that subscribe button to be notified about our latest content.